Good day, Paul. First of all, thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. For our audience, would you please introduce yourself and tell us where you first grew up and what, where you went to college and what you studied? Okay. Um, I was born and bred in the Bronx. Uh, I was born in Royal Hospital. Uh, I went to elementary and junior high school and then the Bronx High School of Science. Um, went first to Syracuse University and uh, then transferred after a year to uh, the State University of New York at Stony Brook. Um, I started actually as a student of uh, electrical engineering and um, I did that at Syracuse, but Syracuse just wasn't my school. I was a hippie from the Bronx who demonstrated against the war in Vietnam and I went to a university where uh, people were worried about how drunk they could get on uh, Saturday night and things like that and whether daddy would buy them a Corvette or a Jaguar or something and that just wasn't my type of people so after a year I moved to Stony Brook but that really wanted to be the Stanford of the East so I ended up after a year of now let's say an A- minus in Syracuse I was struggling at the State University of New York at Stony Brook and uh, after a year of struggling and busting my hump, I changed majors to psychology and uh, combined um, that psychology with um, all of the science courses that I had done for my engineering and also became a teacher of maths and sciences and got a, um, uh, a temporary uh, teaching certificate from the state of New York and um, at that point in time I thought that my educational career was done um, but as I was teaching I got very frustrated and realized that I didn't want to be a teacher. Uh, I got frustrated because I was working with children who were normal children who should have been able to understand what I was telling them and um, it didn't matter how I told them, what analogies or examples I used, what techniques I tried to use that I had learned and that were, were, th those weren't very many, I still couldn't teach them and I decided this wasn't a life for me because there were still those three or four or five children that didn't understand it. So I left the United States. Um, uh, ostensibly uh, for one year to get my head together. Uh, my whole family and friends and things knew what I was supposed to do and that was go back to school, get a master's, get my permanent teaching certificate and teach for the rest of my life and I had no idea what I wanted to do so I decided to go visit some friends in Amsterdam and travel around Europe and India and hopefully within a year get my head together and know what I was going to do for the rest of my life. I went there, I stayed with my friends on a houseboat, um, I uh, worked as a carpenter and a cook in a meditation center, I became the head cook at the meditation center in a um, vegetarian restaurant, um, traveled through Europe and India, but that year became 47 years. Within that first year, I met a woman who became my wife and who was still my wife 47 years later. Um, lived with her on a houseboat, traveled through India, lived on houseboats and in palaces in, in India, in the Kashmir and in uh, Darjeeling and in tribal lands of Assam and Meghalaya. And... Um, uh, wrote a letter to the University of Amsterdam before we left for India, kind of like the day before, because she said, I don't want to travel with you to New Zealand, where we were planning on going. I want to come back and I want to study educational sciences, pedagogy. Why don't you write a letter to the university and ask if you could go back? So I wrote them a letter. I returned nine months later, completely emaciated, dressed in white, and there was a letter saying, could you come Monday and talk to the study uh, advisor here? So I did, dressed in white. And uh, Henk Ter Haar was his name. And he talked to me and he said, well, seeing all of this, 
all you have to do is take a course in uh, factor analysis. And in January, you can start on your master's. So I did that. Went back, got my master's first in the direction I was going was developmental psychology and ended up in educational psychology. I majored in text characteristics and learning processes, what you can do to texts to help people study them in a different way, learn from them better, more effectively, more efficiently, more enjoyably. Um, tried to make use of that at a um, educational publisher because I thought quality should be their advertisement. When I got there, within a half year, I realized that advertising was their quality. So tried to find another place to go to. And at that point in time, the Netherlands opened up an open university, which was making self-study distance materials. And of course, if your expertise is text characteristics and learning processes, now, it couldn't be better. So I went there. And I worked on all different types of courses uh, in the natural sciences and in technical sciences. Got my uh, PhD on uh, the use of practicals, laboratories you'd call them in the United States, um, in higher science education. Uh, went more towards doing research than working as an educational psychologist. Uh, technologist designing and developing courses and those courses were everything from the first course in geology uh, up through um, uh, quantum physics um, uh, programming in machine language uh, uh, toxicology and nutrition all of those types of things and um, did more and more research now became an associate professor, became a full professor in Maastricht, in Utrecht, at the Open University, became a visiting professor in uh, Barcelona and in Olu, Finland. And now I am a guest professor at uh, Thomas More uh, University of Applied Sciences, and I'm retired. And here in the Netherlands, when you're retired as a full professor with the type of things that I've done in my life, you become an emeritus professor. And that's what I am. So in a, not in a nutshell, but in a coconut shell, that's the life story of Paul Kirchner traveling from um, Royal Hospital in the Bronx to um, uh, Hoensbroek, and in, in the Netherlands, I'm also a, a father of four, a grandfather of two, and I call myself an educational realist when I'm thinking in one way, and I call myself a grumpy old man when I'm thinking in another way. <laughs> Is that a decent bio? That is very good. Thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. Um you, you've mentioned some of the efforts that you were involved in. Is there is there anything else that stands out that you could go a little bit deeper in projects, uh, research that sh that uh, you would like to share with our audience? I mean, I, my whole life has been devoted to how do you make um, learning, uh, the learning experience and the teaching experience, more effective, efficient, and enjoyable. Uh, effective is that you, uh, if you want to make it more effective, you want people to either uh, learn more in the amount of time that's allotted to the learning, or you want to get them to learn more deeply than they would have. If you're talking about efficient, uh, if I'm talking about efficient, I'm talking about you want them to learn it more quickly, or the teacher to be able to teach it more quickly, or you want to um, decrease the cognitive load so they can learn more deeply, that there's more processing space in their heads, you have to realize I'm, I'm not, I'm primarily an educational psychologist and a cognitive psychologist. I'm not a human resources manager. I'm not a learning experience designer. Um, I make use of uh, evidence and um, empirical research to tell me how I could possibly make the learning and the teaching experience more effective, 
or efficient. And I use the word enjoyable, and that doesn't mean fun, because learning doesn't have to be fun. Uh, enjoyable means that you experience success, that you have the idea you can do something. At the end of a lesson, you have the idea, I, can, I know more, I can do more than when I started. And with the idea of, by experiencing success, um, uh, you become motivated to learn more. And not that motivation or engagement lead to learning. Uh, if you're motivated, it's great to start. But if you hit your head against the wall, you become demotivated and you stop. If you start on something, even if you're not very motivated, and you see, hey, this is working, you're motivated to continue. And empirical research shows that. So people put me into a pigeonhole and they say, oh, he doesn't find motivation important. I do find motivation very important, but I know that because you're motivated doesn't mean you're going to learn. But I do know that if you learn, you become more motivated to learn more. It's not reciprocal. It's causal. Going from success breeds motivation and not motivation breeds success. Motivation and failure leads to demotivation and stopping. And that's something you don't want to happen. So that's effective, efficient, and enjoyable in my terminology. And that's what my whole life has been dedicated from the time I started studying text characteristics and learning processes in 1977 at the university, City University of Amsterdam. It's now 2020, we're 43 years later, and that's been the guiding light and principle in all that I do, all that I write, all that I research, that's, that's what I try to do. And I try to make it for the learner, also for the instructor, because I also want the instructor to be able to teach more effectively, teach more efficiently. And at the end of the day, whistle while they're going home, having the idea of, hey, it went well, they learned, I had a good day. Because if they have that, They'll want to go whistling and enjoying their work. You know, whistle while you work, you know, like the seven <laughs> dwarfs. You know, that type of, of, of feeling going to their work. I don't know if I'm going to be able to shake the image now of the seven dwarfs uh, uh, as we continue this, but I'll try. I'm dopey. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, I, well, we'll get into to some of the uh, myths. Uh, later on, but uh, I'm an osmosis learner or a wannabe, so I guess I would be sleepy. But uh, okay. let me let me segue to the next question here. And uh, my series is is now entitled. It's changed since 2008 when I started it, but now it's about uh, HPT videos. Uh, HPT being human performance technology, where technology is the application of science and not computers or other kinds of technologies. But uh, what I'm interested in is uh, your first exposure to this. Now, it's known by many different names. Uh, uh, ASTD, now ATD, used to call it HPI, Human Performance Improvement. It's known as Performance Technology, Performance Improvement. Evidence-Based Practices for Performance Improvement. You might call it Evidence-Informed Practices for Performance Improvement. But what, what was your first exposure to this? And I'm guessing it might have come, you know, from your, from your time in uh, academics, uh, you've been there a long time, but this notion of evidence-based practices. Uh, I think um, uh, it might have first started um, when I was studying educational psychology, and I came in contact uh, with uh, the work done by people like Dave Archibald, uh like Ernie Rothkopf, uh, like Charlie Rigolith, um, when I started reading books about instructional design from Marilyn Rigolith, um, uh, when I started reading about uh, uh, information processing uh, theory, about how things happen uh, in our head, um, that could, you would say, would be the moment that I started uh, realizing that um, uh, teaching is both a combination of art and science and it's often seen too much as being an art um, it's often seen too much 
from what we call in the Netherlands from a pedagogical point of view that's bringing across moral values and ideas and things like that. And I began to realize there's something we call didactics, which is a dirty word in the United States. Uh, that means standing in front of a classroom and giving a lecture. But didactics in the Netherlands means the science of teaching, not the art of teaching or the art of helping people grow up or raising children. That's pedagogy. That's the study of children and raising children. Didactics here is the study of the science of learning. And... I had a, a, a teacher uh, there, a prof uh, he wasn't even a professor, he was, I think he would be in the United States an assistant or an associate professor, his name was Christian Hamaker, and he was a, um, a great teacher, but he also brought you into contact with the science that should guide how you create instruction and how you teach. And so I came into contact with um, advanced organizers and the study of that from David Archibald and Novak. Uh, I came in contact with uh, adjunct questions from Ernie Rothkopf and Larry Fraze. I came in contact with elaboration theory from uh, Charlie Rigoleth. Uh, I came in contact with um, uh, Newell and Simon about how we process uh, information. I came in contact with uh, Ade de Groot in how um, uh, chess thinkers think. And it was all based upon uh, what goes on here. I mean, if you look and listen to Archibald, he says the most important thing for learning is what you already know. Um, I wrote in my PhD thesis in 1990, 1991, uh, what you know determines what you see and not the other way around. So those types of things have been guiding lights in my in 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 in, in what I do and what I think. Ernie Rothkopf with mathematic hypotheses, my mathemogenic uh, behaviors. Those are activities which give birth to learning. That there are things that you can do uh, cognitively and physically which give birth to learning. That is mathemogenic. And as Dick Clark says on the other side, there are things that you can do that can make learning die. And that's mathemothantic. Those are the people, the things that I came in contact with. And as you see, I'm, 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 I'm not an HPT -er or something like that. For me, any technology is no more or no less than a tool in your hands. Um, uh, the person dealing with learning experience design and a great learning experience designer is uh, my uh, partner in crime uh, in, in, in this, uh, Miriam Nalen. Yeah? Um, uh, I'm more into... Um, I, I often, I, I used to, as I said, I used to be a cook and a carpenter. And I make an analogy between what a good teacher or instructional designer is with what a good cook is. That's why our website is called Three Star Learning Experiences, because I love cooking and I love eating. And the pinnacle of success as a, as, as, as a, a cook is being a three star Michelin chef. And I say, every good chef, a top chef, has a deep conceptual knowledge and deep skills with respect to the tools of his or her trade, the techniques involved in carrying out his or her trade, and the ingredients of it. And a top teacher also has a deep conceptual knowledge and skills with respect to the tools that he or she can make use of, the techniques, the didactic pedagogical techniques that are part and parcel of the art and science of teaching and the ingredients of good teaching, the questions you ask and your domain specific knowledge. And a top cook, a top chef can make good tasting, good looking and nutritious meals independent of who the client is in his or her restaurant. It could be children at a birthday party or 80-year-old vegan uh, uh, married couple. Yeah? And a good teacher and, and, and can make that delicious, nutritious, and good-looking. And a great teacher, a three-star teacher, is capable of using those three things to make effective, 
efficient and enjoyable learning experiences independent of the age, the size of the group, or anything. So that's about it. Thank you. Uh, I forgot to mention... Okay, we'll please, go first. No, 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 please go ahead. No, 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 that's, that's, that's about it. Otherwise, I might answer the rest of the questions you're going to ask <laughs> answer the all-in-one question. So yes. let's go ahead. Well, it's no secret that I've shared the questions with you so that I didn't want to catch you off guard, and I was hoping for prepared responses, and so thank you for that. So the next question is, is you've mentioned some people here, but so your influencers... The things that influenced you back early as you started your career uh, in this learning sciences profession, is one way to put it. Uh, you've mentioned people, but do you have any particular articles or books that you might point oh, yeah, others of to? I mean, Ernst Rothkopf, uh, uh, you say, um, if, I, if I say David Archibald, I have it about the psychology of meaningful verbal learning. If I'm uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, Merrill and Rigolith, their book in instructional design, Dave Merrill's Pebble in the Pond. Um, uh, if I talk about Ernie Rothkopf, it's his articles about adjunct questions, but also, also uh, about uh, mathemogenic activities. Yeah, He re wrote a beautiful book chapter called, I think, Mathemogenic Activities or Mathemogenics. Uh, Jeroen van Merienboer, uh, a Dutch colleague uh, of mine and, and his book on the four component instructional design model is, is an example of it. John Sweller with his work on cognitive load theory and I could mention about 40 articles about it but in any event his work out in 1988 in which he deals with uh, that and which was very influential also in my article 2006 article on uh, discovery learning uh, with Dick Clark who is then, or to other people, Richard Clark, uh, but uh, uh, Dick Clark, and that was his 1983 article about uh, uh, media and methods that led to the big clark Cosma debates. Yes. Yeah? So th those are the types of things, but also, as I said, um, uh, uh, the book uh, Thought and Choice in Chess from A.D. de Groot, that was originally his PhD thesis in Dutch, and that's where Herb Simon, uh, the... Nobel Prize winner, and I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, learned Dutch to be able to read his thesis because it had not yet been translated into um, English. It was called uh, Denken van de Schaker, and it was changed to Thought and Choice in Chess. And um, his idea of it's not that experts um uh, uh, the fact that an expert is, is an expert is based upon the fact that that person has more knowledge and has practiced longer and it's not some type of magic quality that a person has. These are the types of things. So I could say, I mean, I could take out my bookshelf and give it probably another 20, but um, those are the types of things. Um, um, I wrote a book along with um, Carl Hendrick I'll show it to you. Can you see it? Uh, hold it a little bit. Top. Yes, that's. Uh, we see. Yeah. We see a little bit. Of, we're not seeing the top of the book. The light is too bright. There you okay. go. Bring it down. It's called bit. "How Learning Happens: Seminal Works in Educational Psychology and What They Mean in Practice." And those are twenty-eight chapters, in which each chapter is written by someone that I, in some way. Look either look up to or feel that he or she was very important, is very important in how we learn and how we should teach. And each chapter is five or six or seven pages. It always begins with why you should read. The, it begins with the quote. Um, uh, it then is why you should read this article. Then an abstract of the article, uh, a discussion in normal people terms. Uh, of what was in the article, um, uh, along with uh, some uh, boxes in it. Um, what are the implication of this work for practice? How can you use it in your teaching? And it finishes with takeaways. So um, uh, that chapter uh, the, in, in, in this on, um, let's say, uh, prior knowledge, which is based upon Oshibel's work, will contain all of those five or six parts. And if you want to 
have a good basis in what you could or should read to give you a good empirical basis in how people learn, how learning happens, I would recommend looking at that book. Let's, uh, let me shift a little bit out of sequence here for my questions because I was going to bring this up a little bit later on. But is this, this is the source, the book, for what you and Miriam are doing in your three-star uh, learning experiences uh, blog on the 12 building blocks. Is that right? Um, no. Oh. Um, that's this book called Weise Lesse, ah. which will be coming out in the fall. It's called Lessons for Learning, um, in which... Um, I, I don't know how many people know about it, but uh, Barrack Rosenschein uh, published first for um, the United Nations and then an article for the American Federation of Teachers. First there were 17 and then he narrowed it down to 10 um, things that you should do as a teacher. Uh, kind of like begin every lesson with a recap, um, uh, take small steps. Uh, make sure that children, that the person has learned, all of those types of things. Now, uh, Tom Sherrington did a great book uh, on that, uh, doing Rosenshine's work. What I did with five or six other people, um, and that's uh, Tim Surma, Crystal van Hooywegen, Dominic Sluismans, Gino Kamp, uh, Tom, uh, uh, um, uh, wait, Daniel Muis, and myself, is we said, let's try to distill from all that we know a number of building blocks for um, effective didactics, pedagogy, you would say, in English. And those were things like, I'll open it up and do a connect consecutive translation into English, um, activate prior knowledge, give clear, structured, uh, and um, uh, challenging instruction, use examples, combine words and uh, pictures, let the, your learner um, process things act actively and goes on and on. We did that kind of like combining all of the things in this book. Yeah? Ah. And we wrote that. And um, we did in Dutch, along with a colleague of mine, uh, Wilfred Rubens, who's a uh, more like a media guy. He, we wrote a series for these Corona times. No, actually before the Corona times. Um, sounds like a new newspaper. Um, uh, 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 a, a series of 12 blogs in which he took each of these 12 chapters and said, and how can you use uh, information and communication technologies to this? Because our book doesn't choose any technology. It says this is about how you should do it. And like a, you say to a, 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 a good cook, cook, Choose if you're going to do this with a Cuisinart or if you're going to do it with a uh, scalloping knife or with a hatchet or with a blender or you, you choose the proper medium for doing it. And so he did that. And when this whole Corona fan, Corona shit hit the fan, sorry, yes. um, uh, <laughs> we decided maybe it would be a good idea to translate this also into English so that... Uh, people outside of the Netherlands could possibly profit by these 12 building blocks and how you can make use of in information and communication technologies to achieve those building blocks. Yes. And so it's kind of like a strange cross-pollination of uh, two different books and someone who's really into media and putting that all together and trying to be as uh, helpful to the learning and teaching community as possible. Thank you. I, I I will be including links to that uh, that blog that you do with Miriam, so that people can follow up on that. But uh, I okay, thought it the was eleventh one came out today, and the twelfth one will be coming out tomorrow or the day after. Yes, thank you. Let me shift gears here a little bit uh, okay. as as way of providing an example to others in how we can talk to others about what it is we do. If you were to sh share with us a 30-second or so elevator speech on what you currently do or what you're focused on, what would your example be? You realize now, having spoken to me now, um, that condensing something to 30 seconds is kind of like the hardest <coughs> thing for me in the world. But I'll do it. I'll try it. Um, I would say 
I study how people learn and how that translates into how uh, he or she uh, uh, can best study and be taught in a way that makes the teaching and the learning experiences more ex effective, efficient, and enjoyable. What I do is evidence-informed instructional design. Thank you. You use the phrase evidence-informed versus uh, the, the more prevalent use is evidence-based. Can you explain to our audience why that you prefer that? Yeah, um, because um, uh, uh, teaching is a dirty subject. Dirty in the sense that you're kind of like up to your elbows in mud and grunge and grime. Uh, it's not as clear cut as um, medicine or pharmacy in which you can say if someone has a body mass index is about this age, um, uh, if I give him or her this drug, there's a 99% chance that it'll work in this way. That's evidence-based. Yeah? Evidence-informed is um, having looked at the empirical results and combining that with what I know myself about learning and instruction and teaching, if I do it in this way, I will increase the probability that it will have the outcome that I hope it will have. So you let the decisions that you make be informed by the evidence, but you can't say because it worked there, it will work here. Because we know as it, if you're, what works in the first period of the day might not work in the second because Johnny comes into the second session, second class of the day, and Johnny says, my hamster died yesterday, and your whole lesson plan goes to hell. Yeah? So, um, uh, teaching and uh, education is not as simple and as clear-cut as um, uh, medicine and uh, pharmacology. So, uh, if people think that you can teach in an evidence-based way, they're kidding themselves. Because you can't. You never know if what you're going to do works. If I give the same lesson as you give the same lesson based upon exactly the same principles, our children, our students, our people in uh, companies will learn differently. We can only let what we do be informed by what good empirical research tells us about what works in learning and what works in teaching. Thank you. Let me shift gears again a little bit here. How many gears do you have? Uh, I, I, I've got a, a 17 or so. I, I, 17 I, or so. I've lost okay. count hit, here. Hit clutch. <laughs> I have eight basic questions, so at least there's eight gears here. Okay. Is... Uh, can you share with, as a lifelong learner, what, so what are you focused on now? What are you climbing the learning curve on? And can you share that with us? And if you're doing okay. any writing so that we can explore uh, along with you where, where you're going on your learning journey. Um, I would say at the moment I'm consolidating. I used to be a professor of computer supported collaborative learning. And I also did quite a lot of research on cognitive load theory. But cognitive load theory is based upon individual learning and computer-supported collaborative learning um, is based on, I hate the word, the term social constructivism primarily. And um, there was a difficulty in making the two of them work together. And so one of the things that I'm doing is studying on... Um, how cognitive load theory relates to working together. Because um, if you look at cognitive load theory, it's about um, how uh, complex a task is on the one hand, uh, uh, what a person knows on the other hand, and how the instructional design influences um, how one processes information in their uh, short-term or working memory. Um, that's great. It works perfectly. 
or works very, very well. There are a lot of principles based upon it, up to and including things in the cognitive theory of multimedia learning from Rich Mayer. But when you're learning together in a team, there are um, some extra things that cognitive load theory doesn't explicitly deal with, such as the costs involved with communicating with others and coordinating uh, our actions, which are sources of cognitive load that you don't have to deal with if you're learning individually. So um, I've been busy doing research on um, how the two can best be combined, and that was uh, uh, ended up in an article in 2018 in the International Journal of Computer Supported Collaborative Learning uh, called From Cognitive Load Theory to um, a Collaborative Cognitive Load Theory. So that's number one. Uh, number two is what I'm probably be getting into uh, with some of mine who are still working at the Open University is what I call a, a cognitive theory of multimedia assessment. We have a, a theory of multimedia learning uh, that's based upon a combination of a dual processing theory from Alan Pavio, um, information processing theory from Badley and Hitch, and cognitive load theory from John Sweller. Um, but the problem is if we apply cogn that, that cognitive theory of multimedia learning to assessment, it doesn't work because learning, you're trying to make it as um, uh, you're trying to expedite the processes in uh, working memory to make learning as effective, efficient, and enjoyable as possible. In assessment, you actually want to make it sometimes cloudier and more difficult. You don't want to expedite the situation because you don't want people who don't know the answer to give the right answer, and you don't want people who do know the answer not be able to give the right answer. So that means the principles that you make use of in multimedia learning aren't the same if you're trying to do multimedia assessment. But nobody knows how to do multimedia assessment. And so they either do it by making paper-based things on screen. They're instructional developers who make use of nice ideas about how beautiful can it be. Or they make use of a theory of learning when they're trying to assess. So... I'm trying to now combine models of assessment with the cognitive theory of multimedia learning and cognitive load theory to come up with a framework for multimedia assessment. I think I've reached that stage in my life as 69-year-old grumpy old man, or almost 69, that I'm trying to look at the larger picture. Is there anything that you can share with us about where this seems to be leading, uh, multimedia assessment? Um, no. Um, at this moment, number one, I don't want other people grabbing onto it. But number two, it's not far enough that I'm willing to venture statements about it. Um, uh, my name isn't Donald Trump. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, thank you, uh, and I and I appreciate that honesty because I think there's a lot of times where people are premature with what their proclamations are about how all of this works here, and exactly. that, that can lead us in the wrong direction and uh, uh, cause us to waste a whole bunch of time. Let me uh, so shifting gears again, so you know there's another gear here in the in, and yeah. in, in, in what I'm doing, um, and you may have already answered this one. But I, my question is about the language, the terminology that we have in the profession. And so I'm asking, is there a favorite performance improvement term or phrase or learning sciences term or phrase that you would like to define for us? And perhaps it's, you want to you want to tackle this one because it's not your favorite. It's something that annoys you because of it's being misused or misconstrued or, or whatever's going on. But uh, 
And if you have more than one term or phrase, I'm happy to take them all. So um, how, I think how can I you can... help us with our language? I, I, mean, I think I've discussed both of them. One is evidence-informed practice, and yes. I've explained it. And anyone who says that they work in an evidence-based way and is dealing with uh, instruction or training or teaching doesn't know what he or she is talking about. So that's immediately a reason to dismiss that person. Um, the second is cognitive load theory, which isn't understood very well. People think it's a theory of how can I minimize the amount of load uh, uh, on someone's um, uh, working memory, but it's actually about optimizing the load. Uh, no real pers per person who really knows cognitive load theory will say the idea is to minimize. What you want to do is make sure it's optimized, that you don't choose instructional techniques that aren't beneficial for the learning process of processes. So those are kind of like two terms or phrases that I would say um, are most important to me at the moment. There are a lot of phrases I hate and, um, uh, and, and, and I, I've written two books about them uh, on uh, um, uh, hypes and, and, and myths. Um, there are quite a lot of um, what I call eduquacks in the world who uh, know nothing about education but are selling snake oil, selling snake oil um, because I don't want to get any libel suits. I'll, um, I won't continue on that uh, at, the, at the moment. But um, I think my biggest problem is what I call, and it's one of my favorite phrases at the moment, and it's a, what's called a neologism that I thought up myself. It's a new word uh, that I thought of myself, and it's, uh, I, I call it um, the uh, expertise generalization syndrome. That's people who have expertise, hopefully, in one area, and that think because they know something about one area that their opinions or thoughts carry any weight or credence in an area that they know squat about. And um, I have absolutely no problem of saying to you or whoever you've noticed it uh, that I say, well, yeah, I really don't know much about that. So my opinion is as good or as bad as yours. So I'm not going to give you an answer on that. But there are enough people uh, from um, solid state uh, physicists who put computers in walls, in holes in walls, to um, uh, dramaturgical professors who think they know something about schools. And I say, we have a saying in Dutch, schoenmaker blijf bij je leest, that is, um, uh, shoemaker, uh, stay at your instruments, keep your mouth shut, if you don't know anything about what you're talking about, don't suffer from the Dunning-Kruger effect Very or the expertise generalization syndrome. I, I like that. Thank you. And it's a, it would seem to be most apropos in today's world and uh, the, the times that we're living in. Yes. Let, let, me, let me ask you to define for our audience a, a term that, I like, and I love the concept of it, but I'd like to hear your articulation of what it is all about. Advanced organizers. Um, no, uh, uh, an, an advanced organizers, without a D on it, because um, an advanced organizer is defined by David Auschebel as um, something that provides ideational scaffolding or anchor points for learners to learn things that they don't know anything about because everything's arranged in our heads in, in schema, schemata or schemas, yeah, cognitive schemas. And he said, if you want to do that, you have to present it to the learner at a level, uh, at a higher level of generality, inclusiveness, and abstraction. And those are the three terms. They're not 
a summary of what you're going to learn. They're something that presents it in a way that you can then say, hey, I have a place to hang this new thing and this new thing and bring it into um, contact or, or, or relation with this and that. And that goes back to the idea of um, what you know determines what you see or um, as uh, uh, David himself said, um, the most important thing in learning is what you already know. Um, what you try to do is you give people this set of anchors, this ideational scaffolding in which new information can be meaningfully placed and understood and which knit to old things where these a bunch of these new things can be subsumed into a higher level idea. That's the whole idea behind advanced organizers. And it's hard to do, but it's important to think about. As people uh, try to use advanced organizers, advanced organizers, uh, is, it, is it better to use both the combination of words and pictures, diagrams, graphics, and, and combine yes. them? In, 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 in most things, it's important to, if, if you look at it, we, we have a number of sensory stores in our head. I mean, if you say this, people get mixed up. But you say we have we we we, we look and, and 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 process images, including mental images, in a different way than we process uh, words and sounds. And um, you can even say um, we this this is based on Alan Pavio and his thoughts about um, uh, two sensory stores. Uh, uh, in your head, but you can actually say there are probably five. There's also one dealing with taste, one dealing with touch, and one dealing with smell. And the idea is the better use you make of those different ones and combining them better leads to a stronger memory trace in your head. And there's ways of presenting and, and, and using them together that um, promote these stronger memory traces in your head and there are ways that either don't add anything to each other or actually inhibit each other. So it's not just making use of images and words but using it properly. I give an example of this. If, if I want to um, uh, uh, teach you about the idea of technology biting back and that's the idea that uh, we all appropriate technology in our own ways and sometimes in a really poor way yeah? I can um, uh, write out a slide and give you five bullet points and read all of my bullet points and you say okay it's the bullet points are there I'm seeing it and I'm hearing it and I'm reading it and it's great, but we know from cognitive load theory that's the worst thing you can do. It's called the redundancy principle, and you can't do it. It leads to poor learning. But what I can do is I can be talking about this and show you a picture of a whole throng of people either at the bottom or the top of an escalator and say to you, well, this idea behind the escalator was that if people move and stairs move, you can move more people in less time and it'll be more efficient and more effective in transporting people. But people appropriate technologies in different ways. And as soon as they see you moving stairs, they stand still. And they all throng together. And you get this bottleneck. And it takes you more time. And only in London it works because they know you're supposed to stand on the right and walk on the left. And you constantly hear it. And I tell this and I show pictures of, of, of escalators and things like that. And I can guarantee you that the idea of technology biting back and the people appropriate knowledge in different uh, things in different ways, that it will stick to you better by combining the words that I'm saying, the images that you're seeing, much better than if they were words in bullet points on a screen. Now, both of them make use of words and images, but in the one I'm using it in a complementary way. I'm not repeating what you see 
and what you hear and what you read, and then it works. If you're showing bears like honey, and it, you show a bear, and, and you say bears like honey, and then the, the verbal on the background says bears like honey, it doesn't work. So it's, it's, it's the, the, the complementarity of the different modalities that you use that lead to a stronger memory trace and better learning and better retention. Thank you. I appreciate, I appreciate that answer to my pop quiz question. You, you, you suggested earlier that there were uh, uh, myths uh, that uh, you didn't want to go into. But uh, so uh, yesterday, as I was preparing for this, I went back to my copy of one of your earlier books on myths, and I wrote down the 12 of them. And I, I had read the book uh, several years ago. But anyway, so I wanted to ask you about one that's uh, spe- that's in here that's uh, somewhat controversial, 70-20-10. And while there are people who say it's it's the general concept, ignore the numbers, you know, over the course of your career or your lifetime, what you what you learn is you know seventy percent informal, twenty percent uh, um, from from other social learning, and ten percent through some formal mechanism or means. What can you share with us your thoughts about that, and it, if there's are any it, truth it, to it or none at no. all? Uh, in any event, the numbers and things like that, there's absolutely no truth to. It's pure, how do I say this properly? Pure um, male bovine excrement. Yes, I, I understand that notion. Okay. Um, but so what about the, if you strip away the numbers, is there, how, how do you think about that? The foundation is what you know. Yeah. As I said, what you know determines what you see. Mm-hmm. So, before you can do anything else, you have to create a strong, solid knowledge and skills foundation upon which you can do other things. And that's what schooling is for. Mm-hmm. Okay? Um, most, uh, most of what I am capable of understanding, and then you can say knowing is based upon the foundational knowledge and skills that I acquired. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And if you say, well, okay, um, normally we go to school for anywhere from 12 to 16 years, and if we live to be 80, yeah, let's say we've gone for 16 years, so we've also gone to the university, and I don't want to say that that's the only way you can do it, but 80 divided by 16 is easy, that's Mm 5, you could say, okay, often it's the case that 20% of your life was spent in formal learning. But that's the basis for everything you've learned since then. And I have no way of opening up someone's head and saying, let's now count how much is learned here and how much was learned there. And... To, to, to then say, okay, so you've learned so much here and so much there. What I know is your foundational knowledge is more important than anything else. Yeah? And based upon that, you can then continue to learn throughout your whole life, sometimes in more formal learning settings, sometimes in more non-formal learning settings, But even if it's non-formal, and I'll give you an example of that, if you let economy students, economic students, play some type of business game, one team will win and one team will lose. But if you ask them afterwards, what did you learn from it? The answer is very little. It's a lot of trial and error. They don't understand the model that they were using. They don't know how to game the model to do it. They've succeeded in playing the game, but they haven't learned very much from it. And that's in their daily experience. And then we have that also in in, 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 in business situations. What you need to do is take that step back and reflect upon it 
and think about it and understand it and bring your own knowledge further. Sometimes some people are capable of doing that, but a lot of people aren't. And then they need that formal help situation. And for me, that could be a mentor, that can be a tutor, that can be a teacher who helps that person take that step back, think, reflect upon, ask the right type of questions, epistemic questions, the who, what, where, when, why, and how questions, so that that person then can understand what he or she has experienced, relate it to the already available knowledge, expand his or her knowledge base, and learn from it. That's the way it goes. That's the difference between biologically primary and biologically secondary learning from David Geary. And what we often have to do is suppress that wanting to just experiment or just try out and put it into a situation where it's more structured to help people learn. There aren't very many people who are capable, they may think they are, but are capable of doing it in a complete autodidactic, didactic way. We need help in doing it, and we need a basic, good foundation of knowledge and skills. Otherwise, we're building our bridges and our houses on sand or quicksand. Thank you. So that was myth three in that first book. I know you've got okay. an update to that book here, but uh, myths six and seven, I think, are related. And so... Uh, maybe you can say it's pretty much what you just explained here, but learning better via discovery than having things explained to you is myth six. And myth seven was you can learn effectively via problem-based education. Uh, are those related to what you just explained? Uh, to a certain extent, uh, they are. I mean, if you... Um, the, the only people who are capable of really making use of discovery learn to come up to with new knowledge are experts they know what they know they know what they don't know uh, and they know how to get there and that's the epistemology of the expert but we're dealing with novices who know nothing to very little so if you give them either discovery or problem based and i'm talking in its pure form i'm not talking about the maastricht seven step procedure and things like that um uh, and you let them either uh, discovery or try to solve a problem, they'll do it in the least efficient and effective way possible. That's trial and error. They will possibly come up with solving the problem, but have no idea how they got there, and then the next time they have to deal with the problem, they're back in the same boat as when they started. Yeah? So it's a not a very effective and not efficient very efficient because the goal of solving a pro of of using problem based learning or discovery for learning is not to solve the problem but to learn and that's the major difference in it and um, if you know nothing then you go through trial and error in a very ineffective and inefficient way you hit your head against walls you may end up getting where you want to go, and have no idea how you, how you got there. That's the way I walk through a forest. Yeah? And I have no idea where I'm walking, and if you ask me to do it the next time, I will get lost again. Eventually, at the end of the day, I'll get to where I need to be. That's the whole idea behind it. It's, 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 it's our executive function, the way our brains work. There is no... In, in the absence of knowledge, there's nothing that guides us to where we're going except for trial and error. And trial and error isn't a very good teacher. Mm -hmm. Now, so I want to shift on these to, if you're not dealing with novices and you're dealing with experts and you want to help provide them with some learning experience to do that, one of the articles that you wrote with uh, with Dr. Richard E. Clark, Dick Clark, and, and a couple other people, if I, I can't remember exactly now, my apologies for that, but, but 
I think it was even pointed out in that article that even with experts providing them with guidance, guided learning versus this unstructured approach is even better and has been proven out. True. Up, up to a certain up to a certain extent, it's it's called the uh, um, expertise reversal effect. That the way you teach a novice is not the way you should teach an expert, and the way you teach an expert is not the way you should teach a novice. And um, it is not only not beneficial, but it can also um, whatever the English antonym is of uh, of beneficial uh, deleterious. Yeah. Yes. That's an event. But the idea that even an expert doesn't need a certain amount of guidance, yeah? Yes. Is completely absurd. I mean, I'm seen by many as an expert, but there are also people that I learn from who can help me in my way of thinking. And it's not the same way as if I was a first year freshman student, but they're making use of their superior knowledge and skills to help guide me in learning and thinking better and differently. And that doesn't mean I can't learn alone. I read quite a lot and I learn a lot from it. But in my field, I'm an expert. And as I said, that's the epistemology of the expert is reading, doing experiments, thinking about it and coming up with new ideas. But those new ideas are based upon all of the knowledge that I have. So I'm not coming up with something completely new that's been disproven and uh, uh, or we know for 50 years. That's not a very, if it's been known for 50 years, teach it to someone and have them go further. So those people who are dealing with uh, 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 you know, the 101, the, one, the 201, the 301 series on any topic or task set where you've got the beginner level, the intermediate level, and the advanced level. What I hear is that even at the advanced level, providing some basic structure is important and it's not something you just let them go off and, you know, figure it out for their own because it's not going to be necessarily effective or, at a or point efficient. At time where there's enough basic knowledge and skills, you let the reins loose a little bit. And then you stand there um, kind of like uh, as an assistant looking over their shoulders, an expert looking over their shoulders, and then you choose the moments in which to intervene to make sure that someone doesn't go too far astray. If you look at the 10 steps of uh, Barak Rosenshine, I think around the 8th, once you're sure that the person has done it in a very guided way and has the basic knowledge and has achieved mastery to a certain extent, then you let that person go and you stand there and you just make sure that they don't end up walking off the plank. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that type of thing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And remember, even... Psychology 301, they're still fairly novice. They're more knowledgeable, but that doesn't make them an expert. And you have to just realize that. That's a, that's a problem. Yeah, Expertise is gaining knowledge and skills. That doesn't mean you're an expert. So you gain expertise, but it doesn't make you an expert. Mm -hmm. That takes quite a long time. Thank you for that. And if there's one more myth that I could ask you to speak to, it's this different types of intelligence. I prefer not to go into it because even the person who has thought of different types of intelligence says that it was misunderstood. Yes. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, let me. Uh, there's two more gears to shift through here as we uh, get close to the wrap up of this, but. What I wanted to do in this next segment is is have you tell us perhaps some stories or do a shout out to thank people for what they've done for you in your career. But but again, as a way of pointing others in our audience to people and resources and that. But I also would like to humanize some of these people that we may know by name. We may have read some of their uh, writings, but we don't know them. And... 
so if you could, uh, you know, hmm. take a take a list of people or uh, just a couple of however you want to do this and uh, share with us some more about them so that we have a better feel for them as a human being and not I mean, just the an expert. The most important thing to understand is they're all human beings. Yes. Um, uh, I was at an AECT uh, conference, uh, I think it was in Florida, and I knew Dave Merrill. Yes. I won't say well, but fairly well. And I was talking to him about his children, my children, uh, his uh, new wife, because his wife uh, had passed away, and he's a, a, a Mormon clergyman. So about how um, uh, his uh, religion uh, thinks about certain types of, of, of things. And all of a sudden, somebody came up, and uh, Dave uh, 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 greeted him, and uh, this person said um, to me, um, uh, is it okay if I come and sit down here? And I said, okay, no, 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 no problem. And that was Charlie Rigolith. Now, for me, I had God on the left of me and God on the right of me from instructional design. I was sitting between Merrill and Rigolith. That was, you know, the Bible of instructional design when I was learning to be an instructional designer. The humility, the, 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 the humanness of this Godhead in, in instructional design, asking this nobody, do you mind if I come and sit down with you? Um, that's the type of thing. I mean, um, uh, John Sweller, I've spent hours and hours talking to him, but also traveling through the um, um, which desert was it? It was is Joshua Tree National Park. Um, visiting the place that Graham Parsons' coffin was brought to by his roadies to be burned uh, in, in the middle of Joshua Tree and taking pictures and walking around with him and getting lost with John and Jeroen van Marienboer. Um, I mean, I, I could talk, I, I don't want to gossip, it's, it's just the idea of all of these people. Um, Dick Clark, who... <coughs> was for me from 1983 one of the people who changed my thinking about media and technologies. Um, I was busy with that article with John Sweller on uh, discovery learning from 2006 and we, I asked Dick as a, as, as a critical reader and came back to me. Dick came back to me and said to me, I don't know how to ask this but would you mind if I became the third author of this? You know, and those types of, of, of things, it's, it's, we're very normal, yeah, and we do normal things, and we get up in the morning, and uh, uh, we, 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 we think things, and we eat, and we cook, and um, uh, all of these people are just very, very normal people with their vanities, and their, 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 their good points, and yeah, th that's the type of thing, and it, it's with Jeroen van Merimboer, one of the top educational psychologists and instructional designers at the at the moment, going to um, uh, European and World Championship speed skating and uh, sitting there and smoking a cigar in um, minus ten Budapest temperatures, uh, going to a, a speed skating event. I mean. I don't smoke cigars anymore. He doesn't either. But those types of things, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's just normal people doing normal things. And um, I always uh, encourage my PhDs to make the first step, write to the person, email that person. If the person doesn't answer, make, calling them up, writing another, you know, that, that, type, of, that type of thing. Because... We're all there to help others. Most of the people in my field, the most important thing for them is to help others learn and understand things. And they're great teachers, both pedagogically or didactically, but also by example. So make the step. Write them, mail them, call them, walk up to them after uh, a presentation and get to know them. That type of thing. Excellent. 
Well, that may overlap with my, a little bit here with my final question here. Uh, so what I'm looking for is any parting words of wisdom or guidance that you might have for our audience, especially those who are new to the field, whether they're young people, middle-aged or, or older, like I am, like you are. But how, what guidance do you have for them as they enter into this field? Use your head. Uh, don't succumb to myths and hypes. Think about things. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Use your head. Make use of what you know and what we know and what has been proven. And then do what you're going to do based upon that. Not what you, th what, what, what you feel, what your meaning is about something, what your opinion is about something, what you heard somebody else say, those types of things. Do what you do based upon knowledge. That's the most important thing. And make sure that you constantly stay open to new thoughts, new ideas, and new knowledge and act with it and upon it. Paul, thank you so much for doing this uh, video interview with me and sharing your wisdom and insights. I wish you a good day and uh, stay smart, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe.